And Patty, if you could put back up the questions for discussion that you wanted the panel to address. And I guess I'll, I'll take uh, Chair's prerogative of starting off with a question I, I saved. Um, I don't know that much about many of the chemicals on the long list, but I knew, know a fair amount about PAHs. Um, and uh, they're pretty nasty compounds in multiple ways. Uh, some are carcinogens. So uh, I'm just throwing this out uh, sort of as a devil's advocate here. So the Europeans, you tell us, are focusing on the PAHs. Um, and a relatively small number, even though they may be re-examining that. So I'm just gonna throw this out. Uh, why not do something sort of like that here? They were in a very time restriction to come up with a, a conclusion. They closed all the field, the 100 field in Netherlands, and they are committed to come up with a report in a very soon future. I mean, at that point. So they were, rest they were restricted on how much they can do. Uh, they picked the most toxic carcinogen. When we communicate with them, that they went to the risk assessor that what is the best way to address this imminent issue with a quick response. So that was the approach they do. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not the risk assessor. I, there's different approach based on the time and also the, the project they were required to commit. So I want to make a comment about this because in the mid 90s, um, EPA did a, a study of children's exposures to chemicals, and we did 300 children in North Carolina and in, um, in Ohio. And it was a probability sample, and it was young children. And we did multimedia. We did air, food, water, house dust, dust wipes, et cetera. And um, the levels of PAHs, in children's homes are extremely, extremely high. The house the PAHs in house dust are very high. I think that if we make recommendations about PAHs, we need to be able to look at outside other exposures of PAHs. I mean, just as when people talk about the wildfires in California and the effect of PAHs of burning um, crumb rubber, well, PAHs are a combustion byproduct. It is the PAHs formed by the combustion of hundreds of thousands of acres of wood that is going to be the bigger problem. And I think that whenever we do a risk assessment, we need to look at not just what we are assessing, but we do need to understand what is there every place to, so that we can do a reasonable job. We do need to understand cumulative risk, but we do need to look at exposures and risks from, from the data we, we understand everywhere. So, you know, I just am trying to make sure we look actually, at all of it. I actually don't disagree with you. I wanted to throw that out as oh, okay. a, that's why I said devil's advocate. Oh, I didn't hear that part. I said I devil's advocate. I thought you were just a devil. No. Oh. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Who wants to go next? <laughs> Dr. Bennett. Um, I was, this is back to the big giant peak that you had, especially for the composite field sample. And I mean, it just seems like that is gonna be so hard to analyze. And I'm assuming that's the composite from lots of different fields. Did you look at a single used field and does that have less of a, of a giant mass of things and are there less chemicals if you look at them one at a time so it might be easier to identify? So you're talking about the LC or the GC? The LC. The LC, we have a hump, but when we do the 3D, because it's a tandem mass spec, we actually able to get the hump off and spread it out and we see the individual peaks. The hump is generated by almost like an uh, ocean of chemical with very low amount and almost continuous in molecular weight. But we do see individual peaks that pops up within the hump, 
And having the 3D resolution, we were able to identify the peak and go with their uh, MS2 data, the fingerprint, to identify this chemical. Uh, we do one in, we did one individual sample. Uh, the idea of having a composite sample, it was from four fields. So we have eight different fields for two different composite samples. Is to collect, uh, collect all the chemical fingerprint. If we can identify these unknown now, when we go through it to become the target list, when we go through each field, hopefully we'll cover most of the chemical will show up in each individual field. Okay, okay. And if we have other chemical pops up, we'll go back to the, to the mass spec and look for what are they, and then see if we can confirm it again and bring it back to the table. Okay. So do I answer I the question? Yeah, no, I just was throwing it out there because I thought some of it might be that there was just different chemicals on every field and that was just making it harder to see and identify things. Um, and then I have one comment on the exposure distributions, just because I, the public comment noted some concerns about using the high percentile values, but I really do think we do, you know, if you could go back and re-look at the exposure durations and the percent of breathing and do that for the um, competitive players as opposed to the recreational players, because if it's two different populations, we, we do want to be able to look at the more exposed population and maybe doing it by the high percents isn't the, you know, the cleanest way to do it. So I just wanted to say that. And then on the toxicity, you know, I know that we're worried, we've been talking about the PAHs and the uh, fact that they're carcinogens, but I think that, you know, I, I know, I noticed a couple compounds that we'd found in other studies that, you know, had indication that they were endocrine disrupting compounds on some of those in vitro testing and, and the QSAR type testing. And so, you know, I think we do need to kind of expand out when we're thinking of toxicity and look at some of these other types of endpoints that we're going to get off some of these high throughput assays or um, the QSAR techniques because I think that, you know, there are kind of easy tools, they're first estimates, but it would help make sure that we're not missing anything in a, a sort of a cheap, a relatively inexpensive way, and um, that might be useful. Totally agree. Uh, we are looking at all kind of, not just existing data, all kind of alternative method, how we can, based on different chemical structure, look for the toxicity based on uh, the, the chemical database, how we can draw link between chemical. We are not limited to carcinogen. We definitely interest in all kind of toxicity. So we already look at some of the chemical do have tox criteria for non-cancerous summer repo. So. Dr. Echo. So I just wanted to sort of echo your comments also. So I, I definitely agree that if there is a bimodal distribution in some of these, um, some of these variables uh, indicating the more recreational versus the more, um, uh, not professional, but the more um, uh, uh, competitive, there we go, <laughs> um, players, I definitely encourage thinking about those as two populations that need to be studied. Um, and then my second comment is, I, I get the impression this is maybe the next phase, um, but right now when you're in this uh, phase of identifying chemicals uh, and then in the next phase actually analyzing each field sample, I would encourage you to think thoughtfully about how to then summarize across fields um, the concentrations of these, or the quantification of these chemicals. Um, you know, a simple average might not really be reflective, especially if some of the compounds are, are found only in a certain field and not the other field. Um, I think it's going to require some careful thought for thinking about how to input those into the exposure models. Yeah, definitely, and also address the uncertainty issue or report the visibility of these sample. Uh, statistics is gonna help us try to dissect out these data. Dr. McCone. Um, well, there's this question on priorities, and I think this really gets into uh, a little bit of decision analysis, and particularly it's the core of risk assessment is you know, it's not going through the formalism of risk assessment at its end, what we should communicate to the public is what you're trying to find out is, you know, you want to make sure you're discovering uh, what's possible that could go wrong uh, and be complete but not overreact anywhere and sort of, it's like a, it's like game theory or playing cards. You want to figure out what's possible and you want to know where to, to put your resources. You never have enough resources to go after everything. And I guess it's kind of a comment on on the Dutch approach or the the you know, the approach in the Netherlands, the 
or IBM, which is one way to do this is take something you know well and that you're worried about and then regulate on that. The danger with that is it, it is, sorry about, you know, to refer back to your lamppost again, but it's always going where we know something. And it doesn't offer the opportunity to find something that uh, actually might be a problem. So when you set up these, I mean, so it would be easy to say, you know, anything that's toxic, I'm looking at your priority list, toxic, tall peak, tire related, detected in multiple samples, sure, that's, that's easy. So something, you know, if you have a checkbox, ding, 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 it meets all of those, probably you want to put it in a bin. I guess the thing you have to think about, though, is what about something that is not, we don't know if it's toxic, there's no toxicity data, but wow, it's got a tall peak, it's tire related, it's in multiple samples. Do you want to say, oh, well, it's not toxic, throw it out? No, you probably want to put it, maybe not in the first bin. And so I think you, to prioritize, you need this kind of, and again, I can't off, off and tell you exactly what the weighting scheme would be, but I, I think a lot of people would say, well, anything that, that meets all of these factors uh, or your priority examples certainly belongs in a high priority bin. Um, the trick with binning, of course, is if you're not careful, right, you do everything. Uh, and then you, you hasn't served you at all. Any, uh, but if you don't do it well, you, you know, there's, there's this trade-off between you don't want to be so uh, precautionary, I guess, in a way, or protective that you end up with no useful information. You just say we have to look at everything because it all meets our criteria. On the other hand, you don't want to have uh, some chance of excluding something that might be important. And I'd always say, you know, a chemical that's fairly new, it's a fairly high concentration, it looks like it's important, but it, we don't know about toxicity. Well, there's a lot of chemicals that we don't know their toxicity yet, right? So you always have to be careful not to pick toxicity number one. Certainly, if you know the toxicity, it helps. So again, I, I can't say exactly how to do this, but you want to do this in a way that things, so that you do a priority list. Hopefully, it's not 2,000 chemicals because not going to help you make decisions. And if it's four or five, I think that's dangerous too because there's a likelihood you miss something important. Uh, so I think there needs to be a little bit of, uh, uh, and, and it has to be transparent. I mean, you actually have to explain uh, how you set a sort of a filtering. It's a filtering <laughs> scheme. And there's some people who are really good at this. I mean, it's like Google and YouTube. I mean, and they, all these marketing places do this all the time. They don't know how to steer you. I mean, Google knows exactly how to steer you to something because they're looking at how to set priorities on your previous behavior. So it's a, it's a doable kind of decision science, but you have to figure out how, how you're going to do it. Sorry, I shouldn't be talking about commercial products. But <laughs> there are people who know how to market things based on decision making and behavior classification. Mr. Avel and Tom, so turn off I, your... I'd echo the comments that Dr. McCone made with regard to selection approaches, although I'm not sure I'd encourage you to follow YouTube's example. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, in any case, uh, um, I think that, you know, obviously you have to make some decisions here. We're not going to have complete information. Perhaps you can look at reactive chemical groups as indicators of what you might, you know, based on other information you have, even if you don't have it fully defined here, and that might be an indicator, or families, et cetera. But I think you're going to have to come down to some sort of decisions, and, there, and at the end of the day, we're not going to know this completely. So I think, that, you know, prioritizing this clearly is going to be an issue. The other issue which I want to come back to is the communication part of this for the public. I think that it's important for this which is an incredible amount of high quality science to be interpreted and interpretable to the public. And so I think what I, and some of this will obviously await the, the latter stages when you get to the risk uh, assessment portion of the study, but some of this can be done now. I mean, you can start a narrative that has a paragraph for each of the elements that you've done thus far to describe what it was you did in a way that is approachable that describes what you did and admits, you know, here's what we did in a few sentences that explains this, transfers this information and makes it approachable so people can understand why these were done, how this came to be, et cetera, and give them some level of confidence in this. And then again, at the end, risk communication is going to be important. Often what's done with many of these studies is a lot of resources are devoted to doing the work 
and there's not a lot of resources devoted to the risk community to the communication for public communication at the end and I think that you know as we think through how this is all going to be done there should be some commitment to to outreach to sharing this with the to thinking about how this is going to be shared in formative ways and to make make that and incorporate that as a part of this whole program because I think that's going to be the big part at the end and is really going to help set the tone for what we've learned here. Before I recognize Dr. Kyle, I'd just like to say I heartily agree with what you just said, uh, Ed. And I'm usually in this room for California Resources Board meetings, and uh, it's the same problem with, you know, CARB. In general, uh, Cal EPA isn't particularly good at um, uh, outreach in terms of our uh, information, whether it's regulatory or advisory. Uh, so I totally agree that just as much attention has to be paid to public communication as to the actual science. Maybe not the same dollars, but attention and resources do have to be committed. So with that, uh, Dr. Kyle. Thank you. Um, I have two comments, one related to this, and that is uh, you can't wait till the end to figure out the communication, which I think is what everyone's saying. And I think it's also not just how you communicate the science, but doing the science in a way that can be communicated. Um, and so uh, when you're doing like things in different places, give it the same name. Don't make people learn the concept the same concept five, with five different names in your document. Take apart the pieces in, in ways that you can draw a picture of, you know, like this is the part about the, the stuff coming into your mouth, you know, this is that part. So, and don't put it together in ways that may be good for some analytic process but are totally incomprehensible to people, you know, I've, and I've discussed that before. So. You know, I totally agree. This I do a lot of work in this area. Of course, I'm a proponent of it, but um, I think in this case, it's more than the the communication at the end. I think there's part of this that needs to be reconceptualized about what are the understandable components of this that we can give names to, draw pictures of, and then use in a consistent and not obscure way. So that's my one comment, first comment. My second comment is maybe at odds with everyone else up here, but you know, this might be a risk assessment thing. You know, I do not worship, worship as much at the shrine of risk assessment as many of my colleagues, and that's well known. Um, and I think of it a little more as a children's health question. And a principle in children's environmental health is when you're designing environments for children, you want to use things that you know about, materials that you know about, and that you know are safe. It's just a fundamental principle. If you're building a daycare center, you know, you want to build things out of some material that is characterized and known and with coatings and so on that you know what they are. So you're not walking in saying, gee, I have no idea what's in here. I wonder if it's going to hurt the kids. And um, I, I would like to also assess this in light of that. You know, we're using an uncharacterized or not previously characterized material, or not very well characterized, whose composition also may change over time at the source of origin as well as in the environment, and that can have a lot of toxic components. And it just, you know, I, I think there's some point where you say, does that make sense in a children's environment that you're deliberately creating? And I'm not thinking it does, you know, uh, uh, the more I hear about this. Um, but I, I think that's an additional consideration besides how you do a risk assessment on all of this. That's my opinion. And thank you. Dr. Sheldon. Yeah, um, I, I had thought about saying this before, but once people came up and said, you know, 95th, 95th, 95th percentile, you can get to really ex extreme exposures. Have you thought about probabilistic exposure models? Five years ago, when I was at EPA, they were making those models much, much more user-friendly and rapid. I mean, at, the, at five years ago, we were able to do 100 chemicals, like, in, you know, in less than a month. And um, I think it might but, you know, you might look into it, see what's there, see if it's practical, because that sort of eliminates some of the issues of having to ex look at extreme values. The other, you know, 
um, my modeling friends are going to think I've, I've been converted and taken up their mantra, but you know, the, it does two other things. It allows you to understand what are the factors that are causing the highest exposures, and it also gives you information on what is the greatest uncertainty, important uncertainty, uncertainties in your model. So it might provide, you know, both a more reasonable way to estimate it and some information on if there are high exposures, what are the risk mitigation methods that you can take? So, it, you know, I, and they're not as, at least five years ago, I don't think they were as cumbersome as they were to begin with, where it took five years to do one chemical. Tom, go ahead. Um, yes, I just, I want to add to that comment. Um, I should say I, I did a lot of promotion of probabilistic uh, yes. uh, Uncertainty analysis. And I would say um, it's a good idea, but I want to focus on one of the things uh, Dr. Sheldon said, which is if you're hesitant and don't have the resources to do a full-blown uncertainty variability analysis, one of the most important things to do is to look at your assessment of exposure and just flag things that are uncertain and important. For example, dermal absorption. You know, it's, that's an uncertain factor, and it might be important, right? I mean, it drives the whole dermal uptake, the assumption that roughly 100% of what's loaded on the skin, the chemical, 100% of the chemical loaded on the skin in the soil goes through. Um, that's, that's key, and so you don't just say that was our assumption. You say it in one place, that's our assumption. Later on, you say, when we're comparing these, this is what drives, you know, this is the uncertainty and if we knew more about it, this could go up and down a lot. And that saves you, I mean, you can do that exercise uh, and it saves you having to buy all the software and do all of this really convoluted stuff. And I actually think that having done a lot of probabilistic assessments in the end, what you're really trying to say, you don't want to show somebody these smeared out curves with all this uncertainty and variability. You want to say, boom, 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 this is important and we don't know it well, so we assumed it's this. And if it changes, that's going to change some of our conclusions. I just think that's a more effective way of doing doing that sort of thing. But it is critical, I think, to flag things that are, are drivers in the um, in the final analysis. Any other comments? So I would just uh, agree, uh, as Tom already stated, that the factors that you have listed here in terms of prioritization you know, all makes sense. Uh, and it's just a question of how you deal with those chemicals that don't meet all these criteria. Uh, and I think you've gotten good suggestions from people who know, you know, more about risk assessment than I do. Uh, I also don't worship at the uh, shrine of risk assessment. Um, I actually find it too, um, too f uh, based on assumptions rather than, uh, empiric data, so I just have a conceptual problem with it, but I know you have to do it. Uh, so, uh, Dr. I just had one other really practical consideration on your factors to prioritize chemicals. I mean, when you're looking at these and you have some on the borderline and the standard's $300 or the standard's $10, that, that also might be a factor that would go into your decision-making process. And then you could save resources to, to <laughs> devote to, to public communication. <laughs> okay, maybe not, you're right. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna say 0.01%. Okay, you're right. You're right. You're right. You're I think, yeah, I think we're probably uh, <laughs> ready to <laughs> quit with that little outburst.